Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasul Allah. Welcome to another session of Sunnah followers. And this is our class on how to pray from A to Z. And what I'm doing in this series is detailing uh, the rules and guidelines and the particulars as they relate to our prayers. And uh, yesterday, we spoke about how there are forbidden times to pray. Just as Allah has made each prayer have a fixed time in which we as Muslims can perform it, there are some times during the day in which we are forbidden to pray. And let's put the uh, quiz up on the screen from yesterday to see how well uh, you guys understood. Uh, what was discussed, which I really hope you guys did understand it. Uh, let's look at the first question, true or false? The times that are forbidden to pray apply to the obligatory and the voluntary prayers. Is that statement true or false? In other words, if it's a time during the day that we are forbidden to pray, that means we cannot make any prayers obligatory or voluntary during that time. Is that statement true or false? What do you guys think? False. This is false. False. Anybody got some evidence? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that... Um, uh, he said that uh, the, I'm sorry, I just came. Uh, he said that um, regarding the, I'm not, I forgot what it was. He said that performing the, oh, sorry, I just came. Anybody on. else? So she can't remember. What's some evidence? If you say that the, the times forbidden a, 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 to pray apply to the obligatory, and the voluntary, if they do not apply, then give me some evidence. The prophet said, if you forget the prayer, you should pray as soon as you remember. And if you oversleep, you should pray as soon as you wake up. Good job. Is that Brother Tarek? Murad. Brother Murad, mashallah. Good job. The prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said if a person forgets or oversleeps through a prayer, then he or she should make that prayer immediately upon remembering or waking up for it. So that hadith right there is the proof that it only applies to what which prayer, Brother Marar? This uh, hadith, the, okay, go ahead. The oblig obligatory prayers. That it only applies to, that the forbidden times to pray only applies to which prayers? That's the question. The voluntary prayers. Exactly. The voluntary, the voluntary prayers, not the obligatory ones. So say, for example, if you overslept through Fajr, you missed Fajr because you were asleep. Then you yeah. should make. I need that TV off. If you miss Fajr because you were asleep, then you have to make it immediately after you wake up. Let me put that as an example. A person oversleeps through Fajr upon wakening he or she should make it immediately 
no matter what is happening. Does everybody understand? So the, the forbidden times to pray are only in regards to the voluntary prayers, the obligatory prayers, which are the prayers we have to perform. We make them immediately when you wake up or immediately when you remember. It doesn't matter what is going on in the world or in the sky. Is that clear to everyone? Good job, Brother Murad. Very good, Brother Murad. Okay, let's look at the next question. Question number two. True or false? It is forbidden to pray when the sun is rising. Is that statement true or false? It is forbidden. We cannot pray when the sun is rising. True or false? I would say false. Um, true. It's only forbidden to pray voluntary prayers when the sun is rising. Because the prophet said there's no prayer after the morning prayer until the sun rises. Okay, and who said it was true? That said, that's what's true, right? It is forbidden to pray when the sun is rising. Everybody think it's true? Anybody yeah. think it's false? Yeah. Yes. Okay, we... good job. And this is true. And what did she say? Was what I said because she said the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi said, it is forbidden to pray after Fajr until the sun has risen. Is that the hadith you gave, Manuel? Yeah, Yep, that's the hadith I gave. There, yeah, that's exactly right. Any other hadith? Good job, Elion. Okay, so guys, we cannot pray uh, when the sun is rising. Any other hadith about the sun rising? Come on, um, guys. I have, um, I have one. Um, the prophet said, um come on about the sun rising oh um he said not to pray when the sun is rising because that's when the um unbelievers are praying and um that's when shaitan is in front of the sun and they are worshiping him right the prophet said the sun rises between the horns of shaitan which means exactly what she said she gave the meaning of this hadith, okay? This is the time in which the unbelievers worship shaitan. pray and shaitan stands in front of the sun. So as the people will prostrate to him. The pagans pray during sunrise and sunset. And every day when the sun rises, every day when the sun sets, the uh, shaitan, Iblis, he comes up from out of the sea. You know, shaitan, his throne is on in the sea. He comes up out of the sea and stands in, in the middle of the sun. I mean, in front of the sun. So that whoever's going to worship the sun or end up prostrating him. That's how arrogant and pompous he is. Good job. So those are hadiths that prove that it's forbidden to pray when the sun is rising. Okay, what about number three, true or false? It is forbidden to pray when the sun is at, is at its meridian. Is that true or false? True. That's true. Uh, this is true. The prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that it is forbidden to, to pray uh, when the sun is at the meridian until it moves slightly to the west. Exactly. The prophet said it's forbidden to pray when the sun is at its meridian. And she gave the entire hadith until it moves to the west. So when we pray Zur, Zur is, is, uh, begins when the sun is directly above us. But it's to the west a little bit. If you notice, if, how many of you were able to look at the sky? When it was time for door, the sun, when you, the, uh, we pray door when the sun is above us and we can see our shadow. When the sun is above you, but you cannot see your shadow, that's when we do not pray. That's the meridian. When the sun moves a little bit to the, um, to the left, this is my left, to the left, that's when you can see your shadow. 
So we wait till we can see our shadow to pray through. Okay, and so if you look outside when the sun is right above you, you look down at the ground, you won't see a shadow. That's the meridian. And guess what? Iblis stands in front of the sun at during this meridian too. But if you keep standing there for about maybe 10 minutes, it takes about 10 minutes. After the sun is at its highest, it takes about 10 minutes for it to go to the left. You keep standing there, you will start to see your shadow. That's when you know the Adhan Fadur is, should be called. Because now I can see my shadow. I can see it against the trees. What is it? I can see it against the grass or the ground? That's when we pray through. Everybody got it? But when it's directly above us and you don't see the shadow, that's the meridian. We don't pray then because that's when the pagans pray and Iblis is out of the sea, standing with his arrogant behind in front of the sun. See, he's an arrogant person. You think about Iblis, boy, he has a lot of nerve, doesn't he? That's another example. We talked about pondering the creations of Allah. Ponder, think about Iblis. You got to be an arrogant, pompous person to think that I'm going to put myself in front of the sun because I know everybody getting ready, to, the pagans getting ready to worship the sun. So, hey, I want them to worship me. He's really an arrogant behind when you think about it. How many of you ponder Shaitan that way? Think about him. He And he's got horns. We talked about the jinn. For those of you who don't know, the jinns have horns. Shaitan has two horns. He has two horns. So he's standing there with the sun coming through his horns because he got his back to the sun. And he's standing there like he think he's God or law himself. What a pompous creature he is. And we have humans like that too. That's how Pharaoh was. Pharaoh was one of the people to worship him. Okay, let's look at question number four. True or false, it is forbidden to pray after Asr. What do you guys think about that? True or false, it is forbidden to pray after Asr. We cannot yes. make any prayers after Asr until my grip. True or That's false? That's true. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said there's like no sunnans after the Asr prayer. Okay, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said there is no prayer after Asr until Maghrib. That's the evidence. So we got some Muslims, you know, who are uneducated. They think they can teach themselves the religion. So they'll read hadiths about uh, the prophet making two rock cots after uh, Asr. And, oh, these are two sunans of Asr. No, he was making up stuff. Now, we're going to talk about that in another class. You know, there's an exception to this. If you are making up a, 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 a sunan, not a voluntary prayer, but a sunan, that you always do, but you were too busy to do it due to fighting or something that emergency that came up, then you can make those sunans after Asr. That's the exception. So when you read those hadiths about the prophet doing two rakats, he was making up the sunans. Those were not voluntary prayers. They were sunans that he usually make, the sunans of dur. He would always make the sunans of Dur. But if he were busy fighting on the battlefield and, and, and unable to do so, he would uh, perform those sunans uh, uh, after Asr. But normally there are no prayers after Asr until Maghrib. Why? Who can explain why? Who can explain why come there's no um, sunans? At, no, there's no prayer after Asr. Who can explain why? Um, because the time frame between the Mugger prayer and the Asr are like extremely close. Exactly. So you... Exactly. Because the timeline is so close. We talked about it. If you look outside, how many of you ever look outside today and see the Asr? The, the sky was yellow. Y'all see yeah. that yellow, but right underneath it, you all see that red? 
it don't take long for that red to move up and knock that yellow out. So the time between the prophet said that in an authentic hadith, the time between us and my grip is this quick. You know, because you can be, it's yellow, then you go to, next thing you know, bam, that red, especially in the desert. Like where you guys that live in California, if there's hardly no time difference between y'all, Asr, and my grip. People in Florida, the same thing. My uh, cousin told me there's no, whatever she called it, we don't have that like y'all have. No twilight or what something she was saying, we don't, they don't get. There's so, that's why there's no prayers after Asr, because you don't want to take the risk of ending up praying when, when Shaitan is, is standing there in front of the sun with his arrogance. The line is so close between it and my grip. Okay, the last question, true or false? Voluntary prayers can be prayed after the e comment. True or false? After the call to prayer, the e comment, we can make voluntary prayers. True or false? False. Prophet saw a man praying a two rakah of the morning prayer where where there was a karma going, Prophet touched his elbow and said, shouldn't this be done before that? Exactly. The Prophet saw a man praying two rakats after the e comet and he said, should this not have been done before the e comet so again, this is for voluntary prayers. And what voluntary prayer was the prophet talking about? The what? two rakats for the masjid. Exactly. Those are the two rakats. Two rakats for the mosque. That's a voluntary prayer. And you know, so if you go to the mosque and the ikamit is being called, you don't stand up to do the two rakats for the mosque. No, 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 that you, that's over. You stand in line to get the uh, ikamit and guess what? I mean, the regular prayer and guess what? You will get the reward because your intentions were to pray the two rakats for the mosque. Allah will still give you that reward. Do you guys understand? So if you go to the mosque and the adhan is being called for dhur, you don't make the two rock cops of the mosque. You just go and line up and you will get the reward of making those two rock cops, even though you have not, because it's about your intentions. So when those hadiths about the prophet stopping them from praying, these are the two rock cops, the voluntary rock cops for the mosque. Okay. So don't pray them when the adhan is called. When the adhan is called, go and line up for prayer and you'll get the reward of those two rakats because based on your intentions. Any questions about any of these answers? Mashallah, you guys did good today because I had different people answering the questions. I, this is what I want. I want you guys to come in here and not be afraid. I don't know what you fear anyway. Not be afraid to give an answer and it's wrong. If it's wrong, we'll tell you it's wrong and you know, give you the right answer, keep it moving. Just like you guys have no fear when you in those Kaffir universities or your Kaffir classroom and your teacher call on you, you ain't afraid to get an answer then if it's wrong. Why do you fear me? I'm just a Muslim. I'm the one you shouldn't fear. You should fear that calf or teacher because she can give you a bad grade and fail you based on racism or discrimination. I'm not giving you a grade. Your grade comes from a law. So this is how I want y'all to do every day. Answer the questions like these people did today. But I'm not surprised. Guess who these people were? These are the people that are normally on, on uh, Facebook. They came in Zoom today. Thank you. All right, so any questions about any of these answers? Okay, if no questions, then let's move to the lecture for today. And I do have my PowerPoint. Uh, let me put it up on the screen. Oh, what happened here? Boy, I tell you, it's always an issue. An issue. Today, since we discussed the time, we talked about so far, this is our fourth left lecture on the prayer. 
The first lecture we spent discussing how the prayer is an obligation, not a choice. The second lecture we spent talking about the times of the prayer. The third lecture, which was yesterday, we spoke about the forbidden times to pray. Now today, I'm going to answer all your questions about the call to prayer, the Adhan and the Ikamit. We're gonna speak about the significance of both and their virtues. And there's a lot of brothers here in my website right now who have sent me emails uh, yesterday about the uh, Ikamit and about the Yadhan. I have a couple of sisters who sent me emails asking, is it true about the Yadhan? So I'm gonna, and the reason why I did not respond to you last night is because I knew it was today's lecture. And I'm gonna answer all those questions. All your questions will be answered in today's lecture. And I do have the PowerPoint uh, put on the quiz on Facebook. Go to my Facebook page and see the quiz at the top. There's the link to the PowerPoint. Today, just put number three, where it says prayer two. From yesterday, today will be prayer three. So that way you can review the PowerPoints uh, and also the Hadiths that'll go with them. And then you can also look at this on YouTube because I will put it on YouTube. Okay, the call to prayer, the Arabic term that we use to signify that the prayer time has arrived is the Adhan. Now I want you guys to understand there are two calls to prayer. You have the Adhan and you have the Ikhaman. The Adhan, that's the first call. And what is the purpose of the Adhan? The, uh, the purpose of the Adhan is to let the Muslims know that the time for Fajr has arrived. It is now time for Fajr, or the time for Dhur has arrived. It is now time for door. When you guys turn on those Adhan callers that I that you guys use and like, get on my nerves, and that man is screaming. What is he screaming? He is screaming that the time for door has arrived, or the time for Maghrib has arrived. Whatever prayer it is has arrived. Okay. And if you live in a city or a town or a village that has a mosque, the caller is calling the Adhan for all the Muslims in that city. Now this answers the question that one of our brothers sent to me yesterday. He said, Sister Layla, do I have to call the Adhan at home? The answer is no. I repeat, the answer is no. I repeat again, the answer is no. If you live in a city or a town or a village that has a mosque, for example, I live in Cuyahoga Falls. It's a small city. The mosque is right down the street. That mosque calls the Adhan five times a day. So do I have to call the Adhan at home? No. If I was married, would my husband have to call the Adhan at home? No. If my grandsons were here, would they have to call the Adhan at home? No, because the mosque has called the Adhan for all the Muslims that live in that town or that city or that village. And how? Does the Adhan sound? Well, it begins by proclaiming the greatness of Allah. It points out when you hear those Arabic words, what are those Arabic words saying in English? Well, they're proclaiming the greatness of Allah. They're pointing out his existence and his perfection. Those words mentions his oneness and those words deny polytheism. And those words confer the messengership of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The Adhan also in Arabic, in English, 
It calls to specific acts of obedience after testifying to the messengership of the prophet Muhammad. And it calls to a prosperity which is everlasting, pointing to the return of a law. Because like I tell you, that's supposed to be our focus today as Muslims. Many Muslims, especially the Arabic Muslims, I hate to say this, but it's the God known truth. Many Arabs have forgotten what their purpose in life is. Well, if they listen to the Adhan, the Adhan would remind them of that purpose. That purpose is to worship Allah and to do as many good deeds as we can that will be pleasing to him because to him is our final return. That shows that the Arabs are not paying attention to the Adhan anymore, like the prophet said they wouldn't. They're wasting their time on social media talking about relationships, talking about the psychology of things, the science of things, wanting to know why is it that we can't find happiness? You can't find happiness because you Arabs have forgotten what your purpose is. Remember what your purpose in life is and then you'll be happy. You won't have a problem accepting the quarter of a law. You won't have a problem being single and happy or married and happy or widowed and happy or divorced and happy. Everything begins with and ends with the law. And that Adhan says it all. Everything I'm telling you is said in that Adhan. But it shows that even the Arabic speaking people don't listen to it. They're not pondering the words that are being proclaimed because that's what that Adhan is telling us. Everything begins and ends with a law. Your happiness begins and ends with a law. Your survival, your life begins and ends with a law. That's the Adhan. Okay, and the not only does the Adhan remind us as to what our purpose is, but it comes with many virtues. And there's many a hadith that describe the virtues of the Adhan and the rewards for those who call it. And again, you know, I have to focus on the Arabic people out there, you know, because they are the ones that seem to have lost their way in life. If we ponder the meaning of the Adam and really reflected upon it, but they don't, many Arabs don't want to listen to the Hadith. Just like the prophet said, the Sunnah has become, will become abandoned. The Sunnah will become uh, 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 strange. Many Arabs don't accept the Hadith. Many Arabs don't accept the Sunnah. They think all you have to do is read with Tajweed and not understand what it means. Okay, well, if they would go back to the Hadith, the Hadith tells us the virtues of the Adam. For example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if the people knew what was in the Adam, the rewards of it, and if they knew the rewards of the first row of the prayer line, then they would fight for it. And if they knew the reward for praying the noon prayer during the early part of his time, they would race to it. And if they knew the reward for the night and the morning prayers to be prayed in congregation, they would come to them even if they had to crawl. And this is a hadith that one of our brothers, Brother Haytham, was speaking about yesterday uh, here at the website. You know, each prayer, as we discussed, each prayer ends at the beginning of the next. But the earlier you pray it, brings more rewards but then again remember there are other acts of worship 
that a person can be doing such as cooking for your husband because you want his meal to be on time for him when he gets home. This becomes an act of worship because you're doing it to please Allah. So I can wait and pray my prayer a little later after I finish boiling, cutting up these potatoes. So it's everything Allah made this deem so early. But this hadith is speaking about you brothers, you men, you men coming to the mosque to pray because we're gonna talk about this what a lot of men don't understand is praying at the mosque is an obligation for you. And here the prophet is saying, if you knew, if you knew the reward of praying that noon prayer at, at, in the early time, then you would race to do it. Okay. But still you do have until the beginning of Asr to pray it. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the callers, the callers to prayer will have the longest necks of all the people on the day of judgment. What is this talking about? Again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is speaking about the rewards that the person that calls the Adhan will get. Also another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah and his angels, they pray upon those who stand in the first row of the prayers. And the person that calls the Adhan is forgiven for as far as his voice reaches. And whoever hears him calling the Adhan will confirm what he says, and he will get a reward similar to those who pray with him. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whenever we pray out in the open, like say we're praying out in the woods or we're praying outside, call the Abdan because any creature the ants the birds the bees the trees the flowers the grass any of a lost creation that hears you calling the Abdan, they will testify for you on the day of judgment so that's why the prophet encouraged us you know when we're outside you know even if there is a, a um a caller in your city or whatever to call the Adam because whoever, whatever creation, the birds, the trees, the flowers, they will all testify for you on the day of judgment. Also, another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if three people do not make the call to prayer and establish the prayer in congregation, shaitan will gain control over them. What is the prophet speaking about? He's saying whenever there are two or more Muslims who live in the same city, congregational prayer becomes incumbent upon them. So if there's two Muslims or three Muslims living in the same uh, city, that's when they need to start playing Juma prayer, prayer together and praying together as in a group. That's when they, you need to formulate a mosque. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the Imam is a guarantor and the caller to the prayer is the one who is given the trust. So, O oh Allah, guide the Imam and forgive the one who calls the prayer of his sins. So again, these are just some of the hadiths that speak about the virtues of the Adhan and the virtues of the one who calls it. And a lot of people ask the question, and by the way, guys, let me, um, hold on, let me pause for a second. Wait a minute. Let me put this up. Give me a second, guys. I have to uh, pause for a second. Let me uh, let me set this right, though. Hold on. Pausing. Okay, let's get back to where we were again. Uh, so again, those were so many hadiths uh, 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 that speak about the virtues of the Adhan and also the one who calls it. So we need to really, you know, try to uh, work as Muslims, you know, on living up to that Adhan. Again, listen to the words of it. 
When you hear the uh, the Adam being called on your cell phones, uh, read the English transliteration <laughs> because those words are reminding you as to what your purpose is in life, you know, and reminding you, you know, to remember Allah and not get caught up in the lower parts of ourselves that fall victim to this dunya. And that brings us to another point. A lot of Muslims, at least, especially my new converts, they ask the question, uh, how did the Adhan come, apart, uh, come about? Well, the Adhan was made part of the Sharia of Islam during the first year after the migration to Medina. Remember the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions were persecuted in Mecca, you know, for being Muslim. So they were forced to leave. Some went to Abyssinia. In fact, he sent Uthman there with his daughter because he knew that his daughter would be happier there. And then he went and uh, uh, went to Medina. The rest of the Muslims went to Medina. Medina became the first Islamic state. Okay, and the story is told to us that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived in Medina, the first thing he did was uh, uh, have a mosque built. And then after the mosque was built, they were uh, trying to figure out, you know, how to call the people to it to pray. And at first, it was suggested to use a bell to call the people with. But he refused this. He said, no, because this is how the Christians call their people to prayer. And they still do today by using a bell. He said, we want to be different. And then three companions, they happened to go to sleep and think about it. And they had dreams. You know, they had dreams, you know, of, uh, of, of, of uh, words being used instead. And so when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard about this, you know, uh, uh, that's when he went to Bilal and told Bilal, you know, to come and call the people to prayer. So it was through the dreams of several of the companions that the idea came to say, Allahu Akbar, which means God is the greatest. And Ashadu Allah, Yalaha, Yalaha, Ashadu Allah, Muhammad, Rasulullah, which means that I testify that there is no God other than Allah. And I testify that the Prophet Muhammad is his, his messenger. And then the Haya Allah Salat and Haya Allah Falat, which is come to prayer, come to success, and all of that. That was through a dream. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liked that. And uh, that's when uh, uh, and Umar was one of the companions that also had this dream. So that's how the Adhan came to be. We wanted to be different than the Christians. They used a bell and different than the Jews. The Jews used a, a horn to call the people. So the dreams, it was revealed to use the human voice. And Ibn Umar said the Muslims would gather and calculate the time of prayer and no one would call them. They spoke about it one day and someone said we should use a bell like the Christians. And others said we should use a horn like the Jews. Umar suggested, why don't we just have a person call the others to prayer? And the prophet said, good idea. He said, stand up and Bilal, cause he knew Bilal had a loud, strong voice. He said, Bilal called the people to prayer and Bilal became the first caller too, okay? And again, there are three ways. And this will answer the question that one of my new Shahada sent me. How is the Adhan made? Well, there are three ways to make the Adhan and also Sister Sabrine. Sister Sabrine, you asked about this too yesterday. There are three ways to call the Adhan. The first, you make four top beers at the beginning and say the rest of the phrases two times without any repetition. 
except the last statement of la ilaha illallah. So the adhan would be made up of 15 phrases, as in the hadith that we gave before of Abdullah. So this is one way. Another way to make the adhan is four takbirs and then repeat ashadu an la ilaha illallah twice and ashadu an muhammad rasulullah twice in a low voice. And then repeat these words again in a louder voice. And we have the, the dalil for this. One of the companions says that the prophet taught him to do it uh, this way, the Adhan, which consisted of 19 phrases. And again, I always give my Dalil, this Hadith is uh, approved by the five, okay? And then the third way to make the Adhan is two top beer, and then repeat the statements of witness making the number of phrases 17. And this is recorded from Imam Muslim that Abu Mahzura says that the prophet taught him the following adhan to say allahu akbar allahu akbar ashadu allah ilaha illallah ashadu allah illallah illaha see two times ashadu an muhammad rasulullah ashadu an muhammad rasulullah twice then repeat the ashadu allah ilaha illallah twice see that so these are the three, uh, three of the four, uh, these are the three different ways to make the Adhan. And so if your mosque uses any of these three me methods, then that person has, pro that mosque has properly called the Adhan. Three different ways you can do it. And in regards to saying prayer is better than sleep, this is added to the morning adhan okay so when you hear them do that you know this is based on a hadith whereas the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam told one of the companions if it is the morning adhan then say you know prayer is better than sleep but this is only for the morning adhan that means the adhan for fajr okay and after the adhan is called, this is when we supplicate. Islam is all about talking to Allah, making supplications to Allah. You know, so many Muslims waste their time on social media, you know, trying to figure out how to the key to success. They forgot that the key to success is through Allah. Okay. And they also forgot that whatever you want in life, ask for it from Allah. Allah will give you what you need. Ask Allah to give you, make you happy. Ask Allah to make you whatever. But they forgot that. Well, I'm reminding those who forgot. You know, supplication is what Islam is all about. And even after the Adhan, this is one of the best times to supplicate for your personal dua. It's also a specific supplication that we make after the Adhan too. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that if you hear the Adhan, then you should make individual supplications. Because again, this is the one of the best times to get it accepted. So for example, if you forgot the key to happiness, when you hear that Adhan go off, instead of you wasting your time on social media, talking about relationship problems, make supplication. Say, oh Allah, make me happy. Oh Allah, make me happy. Oh Allah, make me happy. That's the best time to get your personal supplications answered. Okay, and also there's a specific uh, supplication to make too. But let me give you the hadith about your personal supplications. The prophets, but see, this is what happens. A lot of these people don't believe in the sunnah. They don't believe in the hadith. Well, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, any supplication made between the Adhan and the Ikamit is never, ever rejected. I repeat, any supplication or in Arabic, any dua, any dua, any dua made between the Adhan 
and the economic is never rejected. And there's the source. All this, these hasadith is authentic. So if you really want to have a happy life, when you hear that Adhan, ask Allah for it. You really looking for a happy marriage. When you hear the Adhan, ask Allah to give you a happy marriage. You looking for a key to the future. When you hear the Adhan, ask Allah to give you a key to the future. Whatever it is, he said any supplication made between the Adhan and the Ikhamid is never rejected. Also, the prophet was asked, What's, what should, since Allah doesn't reject the dua that's made between the Adhan and the Ikhamid, what should we ask for? The prophet said, always ask Allah to forgive you of your sins and ask Allah for the good of this world and the hereafter. And here's my dalio. Remember, I told you guys, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with making dua, asking Allah to give you the best of this world and the best of the hereafter. We should want the best of this world. We should want the best of the hereafter. And here's the Dalil. The prophet said the best thing you can ask Allah for is the best of this world and the best of the hereafter. See the authenticity of these hadiths. But we have to learn the hadiths, guys. Also, we have another hadith where a man said, O oh, prophet of the law, the people who caused the prayer get more rewards than we do. The prophet said, then ask what they say, what they say. And when they finish, ask whatever you want and Allah will give it to you. In other words, when the people call the Adhan, repeat the Adhan after them. That's why we do that. Uh, one of the sisters here in my Zoom room asked me yesterday, she says, Sister Layla, when the Adhan goes off on my phone, do we repeat after them? Yes. Repeat it, it's being called. Repeat the Adhan after and then make your supplication. Ask Allah for whatever you want, okay? He didn't say it has to be a live person doing it. He said, whenever you hear the Adhan being called, repeat what they say and when they finish, ask for whatever you want and Allah will give it to you. So that's one of the good, the virtues of having that Adhan caller. I don't use it, but for those people who I know, like my mother, my mother uses it because she said, we don't get to go to the mosque. So this is one way to get that reward. When my mother's Adhan goes off, she repeats the Adhan after the caller, and then she'll raise her hands and make her personal supplication asking Allah to make her life longer, her health good, to keep her children ha healthy and happy, whatever. So that's one of the virtues of using those Adhan callers. You still get this reward, you know, of uh, getting your supplications uh, answered. It's the best time to make dua. Wait a minute, hold on, where are you going? I'm going to Urban Air, trampoline park. You're going where? A trampoline park. Who are you going with? Okay, your mother know you're going to? Okay, you talk to your mother? No, but she just called me. Okay, let her know where you're going to. I didn't tell her. Okay, all right. So I'm like, you got the keys of the house, right? I got my keys. Yeah, just take your key. Leave mine here. Okay. All right. Okay, so again, you know, uh, so this is the best time to make your personal supplication. Also, we have another hadith from Um Salama. She said the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught her to say after the sunset adhan oh allah this is the beginning of your night and the end of your day i have called upon you so forgive me of my sins so again you know some of us we commit so many bad deeds we want allah to forgive us of our sins the best time to ask for forgiveness is after the adhan Again, between the Adhan and the Ikhamit, whatever you ask for will never be rejected. And I can testify that that is true. Okay, because it works for me. I get whatever I want. You'll get what you want to. All right. 
And again, a lot of people uh, like to call the Adhan for the mosque. And I remember uh, uh, one brother asked me, Sister Layla, I got a lot of people that want to, is, are there certain conditions that the people have to meet in order to be a caller to prayer? Well, number one, if you want to be the person to call the Adhan for your mosque, understand that you're doing it for the sake of Allah, not for money and not for fame. I know one brother who told me that he likes to call the Adhan the mosque because he wants the Imam to see how well his voice is so that perhaps the Imam will marry him to his daughter. I said, brother, a stock for law. That ain't the reason to call no Adhan. It's got to be for the sake of Allah, not for money, not for fame, not for anything else. No woman, remember, you get what your intentions are. Allah knows what's in your heart. Allah knows that you're doing this just to try to get a woman. Well, you know what? Stop trying to get a woman and instead try to get with the law because there's a lot of rewards for being a, a caller, you know, to the prayer. Okay, so again, one of the conditions is you have to be doing it, you know, for the sake of Allah, not to be paid. We have a hadith, whereas uh, Uthman ibn Abu al As, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to make him the imam, to make him the imam of, uh, uh, make him an imam. The Prophet said, "Okay, you are their imam, but be careful." about the weak people amongst you. And when you make a point a person to be the call, caller to the prayer, make sure you appoint a caller who does not accept money for it. So if you are gonna be calling the Adhan, you are not to be paid for that. Everybody understand that? Also, the person that calls the Adhan must be clean from major or minor impurities. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told one of the companions, nothing prevented me from returning your greeting except that I dislike to mention Allah's name when I am not clean. So in other words, whoever is calling the Adhan, he should have wudu. You guys see that? And this answers another one of the questions that the new Muslim sent to me. Uh, do you have to have wudu to call the Adhan? Well, there is your answer. Everybody got it? There's your answer. Okay. There's your answer. Also, whoever is calling the Adhan should stand and face the direction of the Kaaba. And you should turn as you're calling your head and neck when you say Haya Salat, turn to the left and Haya Salat. You should turn your head and neck when you're doing, we were reciting those words. And that's based on the following Hadith. Abu Juhayfa says that, that Bilal made the Adhan and you could see the movement of his mouth from this side to that side when he said, hi Allah Salat, hi hi Allah Salat, and hi Allah Salat, that part. Also, if you're calling the Adhan, you should insert your index fingers into your ears. Where's the Dalil? Here it is, Bilal. He said, I put my index fingers into my ears when I made the Adhan. And also when calling the Adhan, you should raise your voice, even if you are alone outside. This is based on a hadith where Abu Sa'id al-Qudri said, I see that you love the sheep and the desert. If you are with your sheep or in the desert, then raise your voice when making the Adhan because any jinn, human, or any other thing that hears you will be a witness for you on the day of judgment. That's the Hadith I told you about. And also when calling the Adhan, you should pause between each phrase, just like we do when we recite Al-Fatiha. 
Allah doesn't like you rushing, you know? So pause after each sentence. Stop, take a breath, then do the next. Stop, take a breath, pause. You know, everything we do as Muslims is done with dignity. We are supposed to be. We don't see it today, especially when you see so many of us lost on social media. But we are supposed to be a people of dignity. Everything we do, our life and our death, is supposed to be with dignity. You don't want to live an indignified life. And you don't want to die an indignified death. But unfortunately, most of us don't live with dignity. And that's why most of us die without dignity, subhanAllah. Okay, so that's all we need to know about the first call to prayer, which is known as the Adhan. And also I want to share a couple of things here. Number one, women, I repeat, women do not call the Adhan. And I know that this is a widespread practice in Egypt. Hello. Yes, I've heard my homeland. Put, put it this way, my father's homeland. They got women calling the Adhan. A stuck for law. And these women want to know why they can't find husbands. Why they waste their time on social platforms, you know, social media platforms, talking about relationships, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, ain't never been married. They all about feminism. Ain't no feminism in Islam. You such a feminist that you think it's okay for a woman to call the Adhan? Women do not call the Adhan, number one because it entails beautifying the voice. And these same women that sit on social media complaining about why they ain't got a husband and they 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, listen to how they talk with those baby voices that Allah told them in the Quran, don't ever soften your voice publicly, but they still doing it as they call the Abam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there is no Adhan for a woman. What does that mean? A woman approached the Prophet and she said, oh Prophet of Allah, we don't go to the mosque to pray all of us. So should we women call the Adhan for ourselves in our home? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there is no Adhan for a woman because it entails beautifying the voice. And you women have been commanded by Allah to never soften your voice so that me in the presence of men, because this is a problem with Arabic women. It was always a problem with them and it still is today. They prostitute themselves with their voices and they still doing it. Check out the club. They all sound alike. You can't even tell them apart. Okay, so there is no Adhan. The woman doesn't have to call the Adhan when she prays, number one. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, any woman that calls the Adhan and leads a man in prayer has the curse of Allah on her, and that man's prayer is not accepted. So you women in Egypt who's sitting around calling the Adhan and you're wondering why you ain't got no man and can't find one, all your men over here in America marrying women like me. Hello, because we know the Dean and we live it, we practice it. And we don't care about being married. Most of us, we care about a law and we accept the Carter of a law. You know, any man, who prays after a behind a woman who doesn't call the Adhan. That man's prayer ain't even accepted. Any man that prays behind a woman, that means she's leading him, his prayer is not accepted. 
The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said any nation that allows a woman to be its imam and lead it, that nation will never succeed. It will always fail. So that's something that you Egyptian women who are all about feminism and all about women's rights, women should lead the prayer, women should call the Abdan, we are PhD, then we are this. Go sit down. You have the curse of a law on you. That's why you ain't got no man and ain't gonna ever have one. And that's why your life is miserable and you sitting up in the club unhappy, crying about your relationships that don't exist. Take that curse, remove the curse of a law off of you and learn your place as a woman. Learn your role as a woman. Learn what your life is supposed to consist of as a woman and develop that relationship that you're supposed to have with Allah. And then maybe Allah will take away all your misery, your unhappiness, your bad, failed relationships, and or, or whatever, your non-existent relationships, whatever. Change the condition of yourself, you women. And then Allah will change you. Okay, so women do not call the Adhan. Women do not lead men in prayer. And I hope that's clear because this is a terrible innovation that is going on around the world now. And people think it's cute. They think it's nice to see women calling the Adhan and women leading men in prayer. And these women, it seems like most of them are coming from out of Egypt. And that is sad. All right. So we're going to stop right here for today. If you have any questions or comments, inshallah, you can type them. Tomorrow, we're going to continue on by speaking about the ikamet. The ikamet is the second call to prayer. And we're going to speak about the difference between the ikamet and the, and the aban. So we'll stop right here. If you guys have any questions or comments, inshallah, you can type them. Supana kala huma wa bihamdika, a shadow on la ilaha ila anta, a stock wa tubu ilay.